but Zach, my friend said Safe Moon has gone up a million percent in the past week. Why would I buy Bitcoin when I could buy Safe Moon or Dogecoin? I got my Pinot Noir here. I'm, I'm ready to go. Uh, and it's a fun, it's a topic that I'm very passionate about and uh, that I hope to be able to share some knowledge with people about. Um, the topic today is Bitcoin, money, and fiat currency, and also how Bitcoin relates to other cryptocurrencies. Um, it's kind of a crazy time for cryptocurrency. It's a crazy time for Bitcoin, but it's an exciting time. And having been in the space uh, for a very long time and being able to observe it in its infancy and, and see what it's become, um, it's, it's very exciting and also very scary for people that are new to the space. So I hope to maybe demystify it a little bit, explain not only what Bitcoin is, but how what money is and how that relates to fiat currency and the dollar that we use. And I hope to be able to explain why Bitcoin is so important and why Bitcoin is different than other cryptocurrencies. So um, grab some wine, whatever your snack or your drink of choice. Uh, sit back, relax, and uh, let's talk about Bitcoin. So first, in order to understand why Bitcoin is so important, you have to understand what money is and what, uh, what we currently use as money and how that operates. Because if you don't understand that, then what Bitcoin is, it doesn't really matter to you. And you might as well just buy any, anything in any other cryptocurrency. So... What is money? Money is really just a metaphor. So people like to talk about Bitcoin and say, you know, what backs it, what gives it its value. Um, but the same questions can apply to fiat currency uh, or even gold. So I'm going to go into a little bit about what gold is too. But, but money, again, it's just a metaphor. And it's a way for us to, as humans, store value and store our time and our energy and our effort. So humans are able to abstract in a way that other animals and creatures can't. And one of the ways we've done this is by giving things value that don't really have value. Like if I need food, that has value because it keeps me alive. If I have um, shelter that keeps me safe. If I have uh, a gun or a weapon that keeps me safe, that gives me protection. Um, these things have value in and of themselves, but a dollar or money, it only has value because of something that's called the network effect. That if, if you think the dollar has value and I think the dollar has value, then that gives it value. Um, it's a consensus. It's, it's an understanding that, hey, if I take this thing, someone down the road is going to take it again and give me something that I need. And it's, a, it's also a way for us, like I was saying, to store up wealth, to store up time and energy because humans are able to produce so much more than other creatures or other animals because, because of our brains and our consciousness. And we're able to set aside value and try and store it for a future date. And this is what money has given us as a way to um, yeah, store up energy. It's, it's basically human energy condensed into an abstract. And what gives it its value comes, like I said, completely from the network and people agreeing that it has value. Now, to get more specific to talking about the dollar, the U.S. dollar as a fiat currency, 
Um, every government around the world issues its own currency. Where it gets its value is a little muddled, but let's stick to the, the U.S. dollar, the fiat currency. So the word fiat, a lot of you may have heard fiat and not know what it means. It just means government decree or by government decree. So like a fiat law is also, you know, it's a government created law. So by government decree, what does that mean? It, it means that the government will use its powers to give the government value and the government's powers are force and violence. So it means the guns of the state are going to back up the U.S. dollar. They're going to enforce it. They're going to tell you to use it and not use other things as the local currency. So primarily in the past, the dollar used to be backed by gold. And that's important because gold throughout most of human history, well, most recorded human history, has been a store of value. Um, the reason being because gold is a scarce resource, you know, it's, it's easily identifiable. Um, it's not fakeable. Um, it's, and it's just something that people, even primitive man have seen gold and those oh, shiny metal. It's something that people value because it, it looks pretty, it looks beautiful, it looks uh, special. And then, of course, royalty adopted it as well. But it works as a store of value and as a currency because there's a limited its, its supply. It's not hyperinflating. It's not you can't make a ton of extra gold. You can't just print gold. Um, you can't turn other things into gold. That's what you know. The alchemy was all about was trying to turn things into gold. You can't do it, and that's why gold is valuable, and that's why it's it's held its its value over time more than other local currencies or fiat controlled currencies. Um, you know, over time, all fiat currencies value go to zero. Either the the country collapses or the currency itself just collapses <clears throat> because of issues that I'm going to go into that, that exists with the current monetary system. So let's get in now. Yeah, let's go ahead and get into what do we have now. So fiat currency in the U.S. specifically. So it's centralized. These, these are the aspects of the currency that we currently have. And then I'm going to come back and compare them um, to Bitcoin. So the current, what we have now is centralized. It's controlled by a government. It's controlled by banks. They can print it at will. Um, they control the issuance. They control um, what the loan rates of the country. They control um, even if you can buy or sell things. So that that's a huge issue right now with censorship. And banks, not just governments, but banks banning people from using them, from using their credit cards, from accepting payments. So a centralized controlled currency, which is what we've had throughout most of history, even gold to a certain extent is centralized. It's been mostly owned by banks and governments. Um, there's a lack of transparency. So we don't control monetary policy. We don't know exactly how many um, dollars are in circulation. We, we just have to go with what they tell us. Um, you know, we, we can't control fractional reserve banking where they can print, they can, they can loan out more money than the banks currently have in savings. So they can, they are basic, they are creating money out of nothing yet. When you go and buy a house, the bank doesn't actually pay for that house with someone's money that's in the bank. They create money out of nothing and then you owe them money to pay back their imaginary money. So it creates inflation, it creates money that's not really there. And the reason, the reason you don't want money to just come out of nowhere is because it decreases the value of your money and that gets us into our next issue with is our current currency is inflation. Our in current, it's not hyperinflating yet, but it's on the road to hyperinflation. Um, again, we have fractional reserve banking where, where banks are printing money 
and then governments are also bailing out those banks when they're in so much debt that they, they can't pay back anymore or they have ta toxic loans, um, the government then bails them out. And how does the government do that? The government doesn't just take money and taxes, although it's doing that as well. Um, the, a huge form of inflation is printing money, literally generating dollar bills from nothing and circulating them into usually banks. Um, so they're adding more money, which, create, which means the money that we all hold is losing value. The energy that we're storing is being diluted. So we talk about money being a store of value and storing energy. By printing more of it, by creating more of it, you're diluting the value of what you hold. It, it means that that thing that you have is less unique, it's, it has less buying power, it's less valuable. Um, I already talked a little bit, because of the transparency, it's censorable. So I didn't mention that word specifically, but that's what it is. They're censoring people with money and blocking them out of the system. Money is also hard to hide. Um, if you just want to store money, not in a bank, um, you know, where are you going to put it? You're going to put it under your mattress. Someone robs you, you they got all your money. You know, there, there's really nothing. You can put it in a safe. Obviously, then they can target the safe and just get your money later. So cur fiat currency is also, I don't know if this is a word, permissionable money. You need someone's permission to use it. So um, the government or the banks can take that permission away. That also comes back to being censorable. Just in summation, uh, so the dollar is centralized. There's a lack of transparency. Uh, there's inflation. It's censorable. Uh, it's hard to hide. And you need permission from banks and governments to use it. So... Now I'm going to get into Bitcoin and its properties and what makes it so important. And it's not just because you can make a quick buck. Like we're see there's there's two things that are happening simultaneously right now with Bitcoin and crypto. One is Bitcoin has created the hardest monetary asset that has ever existed. And two, fiat all over the world, but right now in America especially, is inflating. And it's causing wild things to happen in the marketplace, which is causing people to spend their money in wild ways. So they're investing in things like game stock stonks. You know, they're investing in Dogecoin. Um, this is a, two separate things. Bitcoin has been gaining in value and creating an entire cryptocurrency marketplace in its wake because it is the most important invention of our generation, maybe in the entire lifespan of humanity. Um, it, creates, it creates a way of humans storing and exchanging value that is f in the free market. That is not controlled by a government, that's not controlled by a bank, that's going to use violence and manipulate society to get what it wants. So Bitcoin, so let's go through the list. So fiat is centralized. Bitcoin is decentralized. It's literally just a network of people agreeing voluntarily to use it as a program and adopt the code. It 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 is it is decentralized governance without government, without a ruler. It is rules, but there's no ruler. So we're all agreeing to play by the Bitcoin rules when you use Bitcoin, but no one is forcing you to use it and there's no top-down control. And in fact, the network effect, the network that uses Bitcoin can change Bitcoin over time and it can evolve based on the people using it. Um, Bitcoin, or, so fiat has a lack of transparency. Bitcoin uses an open ledger and open source code. So I'm going to break that down a little bit, but it is completely transparent while the current monetary system is 
opposite of transparent. First, the code. Bitcoin is an open source program. So what that means is that it, it's an open box and programmers all over the, the world have tinkered with it, can download the code, can go through it, can see exactly what is in there and what exactly is going to happen um, with the code and can copy and paste it, which has been done, which people have made other coins based on Bitcoin using the code and altering it. And people can, uh, can offer updates to the network and the network can choose to bring on those updates or reject them. Which, which is another one of Bitcoin's strengths I'll get into later. But. So it's an open code, um, which is done all the time. A lot of things people use, there's an open source version of like Word, which has the whole suite of Word, which is just made by people for free and you can donate. Um, there's open source programs for emulators for playing like NES games and Super Nintendo. The internet is full of free programs that people tinker with and they're open source and you can update them. Um, Bitcoin is an open source code that's, it's meant to be like a protocol layer on the network, which I'll get into as well. It's like IP address, which is what the internet uses. But Bitcoin is a monetary network protocol that the internet can use and layer things on top of. Um, but it's an open, transparent code. And the ledger, so Bitcoin uses what's called blockchain. All blockchain means is an open, it's an open um, ledger or just a history of transactions. So I sent you this much Bitcoin, and then it gets filed away in this open ledger that proves that this coin moved to you, and we can always reference back to that. It works in the same way that... Um, Kids of the 2000s will know uh, like LimeWire or torrent files. So how torrents work or LimeWire or any of these where you download an MP3 or you download a movie through illegal means or you, down, you can download software this way. Um, a lot of open source programs are, are sent over this network, P2P networks, or pro, uh, PC to PC or person to person. Um, so how that works is no one company, like right now, if you, if you try and watch a Netflix movie, that's downloading from the Netflix servers. It's coming directly from one company to you. Now, they may have different hubs set up throughout the country to try and get that data to you faster, but it's one company sending you the movie file that you're downloading. P2P, LimeWire, um, or torrent files work Anyone that has downloaded that file on the torrent network can upload bits to you. So you go online and you say, I want to download so-and-so movie. Um, it da you download the basic file, which has the, the seed information. And from that seed, it then pings the network and says, who on their computer right now has this file? and is using this torrent program, send me some of that program. So it's a way that, to not have a centralized place, not have an Amazon network or a Netflix network that's going to send you that file. But anyone that's downloaded that file now can share the file with you in little bits, and it can, this program will download the bits and piece them together until eventually you have the whole movie file or the whole music file. In the same way, Bitcoin does this with transaction information, and that's all it shares. It's one giant file that shows you the entire transaction history of Bitcoin back to the very first one when Satoshi Nakamoto sent the first transaction. So it's using P2P software to sync up all of the history so that you don't need a government or a bank to say, yes, this transaction is real, this is fake. This is real. This is fake. The network is doing it in real time, syncing up all of the history. And if someone tried to publish a block that did not match up to the last one and, and sync up with the full history of Bitcoin up to this point, it would be rejected by the network. So everyone's sharing it and updating it in real time. 
So that's the open reg ledger, and it's completely transparent. So anyone can go in right now. Any Bitcoin that you receive, if you go to Coinbase or you go somewhere and you buy Bitcoin, and then you take that Bitcoin out of Coinbase and you pull it into your personal wallet, that transaction, when Coinbase sends that coin to your wallet, is then put into the ledger. And when you see your coins arrive in your wallet, you can click and see in the blockchain history your coin and where it came from. And you can track it all the way back to when it was mined originally into the blockchain. So the entire history of every coin goes all the way back to the very beginning. So this gives Bitcoin security because we know all of the transaction history so no one can fake it and say, I have this many coins because you can follow them all back. Um, and it also gives it transparency so you can go in and see and prove these things. The next primary issue with fiat currency is inflation. So being able to print an infinite amount of a currency um, to bail out banks, to go to war. I mean, this is a huge reason that World War II and World War I happened was our government got off of the well, governments around the world, got off of the gold standard, and they were able to print infinite amount, amounts of money to pay for soldiers and armaments and blow up other humans. So Bitcoin is not only not inflationary, it's really deflationary. It's a set supply. So Bitcoin, there will only ever be 21 million Bitcoin. It's written in the code, and again, it's open source. So you can go in, you can read it yourself. Um, you can download the code and see exactly what is scheduled to happen. 21 million Bitcoin will ever be created. Right now, we're around 18 million. So most of the supply has already been created. Um, and in fact, although right now it is inflating, once all of the Bitcoin are mined, it's really a deflationary currency because Bitcoin can be lost and and many bitcoin have they, you know no one knows exactly how many but people have guessed around a million bitcoin have already been lost but if you know if you send it to the wrong address if you lose your your seeds phrase which I'll get into later what that is but if you lose your codes that give you your coins it's gone and for most of bitcoin's history it wasn't it wasn't a get rich quick scheme, which a lot of people think of it as now. It was just a funny thing that people were doing. So people lost coins left and right in the early days of Bitcoin. In fact, people gave away coins in the early days of Bitcoin. There were things called, um, oh, I forget what it's called. Uh, not a tap, but yeah, they, they would just give Bitcoin away for free. You would do these trivial th things online and, and get Bitcoin because people just wanted to get people to use it and get engaged. Um, and so many Bitcoin back then were lost by people that just saw them as worthless. So Bitcoin is set to 21 million. It cannot be inflated and that cannot be changed. Um, so it's it's less deflationary than gold, um, which gold now inflates at like two to four percent per year, which is actually where Bitcoin is right now. It's inflating at about two to four percent, but Bitcoin actually cuts how much it inflates in half every four years until eventually all of the coins are mined and then there's no more new Bitcoin. So the next thing, so censorable. Bitcoin is the opposite of censorable. It works just like I said, P2P or torrent downloading programs, which have never been stopped um, because it's all about the network effect. Again, as long as some people around you have this file, you can get the file from them. There's no central authority to take down or destroy. It's a distributed network of people that keep it running and keep the Bitcoin code and the history of Bitcoin intact. They're, they're saving that for the future. Imagine... Imagine like the Library of Alexandria, all those precious like artifacts and things and, and books that got destroyed. If they were on the blockchain, if they were stored in a way that could be shared and distributed in millions of places, billions of places around the world, you can store something for a very long amount of time. Um, it's also uncensorable because 
yeah, governments can't governments can't shut down everyone's computer and all of the networks everywhere because networks will always pop up again and reconnect and resend the file. More specifically, Bitcoin is uncensorable because it's just an open source network that anyone can join, anyone can create a wallet, and anyone can receive Bitcoin to that wallet without asking anyone's permission. You don't have to go to a bank to say, hey, can I create a Bitcoin wallet? You don't have to go to your government and say, hey, do I need a license to get this Bitcoin and get this Bitcoin wallet? No. You just generate a wallet, you get your private keys, and you give people your receiving address, and they can send you Bitcoin, anyone on the network. You don't need to input your name, anything about your history, anything. It's just, boom, you have a wallet and you have access to the Bitcoin network. And you can't shut down sending or receiving coins on the network. It's Again, it's a distributed network. What else? It's hard to hide money. Bitcoin can't really be stolen. So... Bitcoin is based on cryptography, which means that unlike fiat, you can't just break into someone's house and take all their money. In order to access your coins, you need a 24-word seed phrase or a 12-word seed phrase, which is your cryptographic key, which will allow you to access your wallet and your coins and spend them or receive coins. So... As long as you have those words in your head, you don't even have to write them down. Or if you do write them down, you can set the, separate them or encode them in a way that people can't just know what your seed phrase is. Um, it's very easy to do this. So even if governments wanted to steal everyone's Bitcoin one day, like in the past, they've stolen everyone's gold before they went to war, uh, they would not be able to access the coins. You know, they, they could steal your hardware wallet. They could steal your words that were encoded. Again, they, they, you know, they just have to threaten to shoot you or kill you and, and try and get the words from you that way. But that's not a very easy way to extract people's money and causes way more resistance and way more trouble than, than governments can really go through. So also, transportability. So... To transport fiat, you need, again, government permission or bank permission using the bank network. But government, uh, but Bitcoin is transportable without anyone's permission. Again, it's just an open network. As long as you have access to a wallet, you have access to the network, which means you can receive Bitcoin or send Bitcoin to and from that wallet. So we'll get a little more into what a Bitcoin wallet is later um, but now we're going to go to Bitcoin versus other cryptocurrency. So why is Bitcoin important versus Ethereum or Litecoin or Dogecoin? But Zach, my friend said SafeMoon has gone up a million percent in the past week. Why would I buy Bitcoin when I could buy SafeMoon or Dogecoin? Well, I'm going to tell you. So, again, Bitcoin, not only was it the first to solve these problems, um, but it pieced itself together in such an elegant and perfect way that has caused it to not only increase in value, but it proved the space and created an entire market around it. So all these cryptocurrencies that exist now that people are chasing, they're trying to make money on, I'm sure some of them will turn into valid projects as time goes on. But right now, it's mostly a lot of people chasing money with a fiat currency that's decreasing in value. So people are panicking out of their currencies into all kinds of things, the stock market, um, the housing market, cryptocurrencies, that's going to happen for a while. That's going to keep happening. And it's only going to get worse as the fiat dollar inflates more and more and more all over the world. So, but Bitcoin has a, a unique history. So it proved the space, but it also developed in a way outside of this 
greed and this chasing for money that's happening right now. So you see people chasing dollar go up. They see new coin come out. Oh, Elon Gate, like the the and the na- come, come rocket. The name of these coins is is mind boggling, and it's just ways to get people's attention and try and get their money. Bitcoin is made to last. It's secure, and it proved itself secure over a twelve year history. And the first, I would say, third of that history was completely outside of the people chasing the dollar. They were just interested in the technology. They wanted to tinker with it. They wanted to see if it would work. They wanted to prove that it could work. Um, and hobbyists and enthusiasts all over the world played with Bitcoin and gave it away. Um, uh, the word I was trying to think of earlier, faucets. There used to be faucets where they would just give Bitcoin away. They would encourage people to download nodes. So the nodes is what helps decentralize the network. And Bitcoin is made in such a way that anyone in the world can download a node on the most primitive of computer as long as they have some hard drive space and the node can download the entire history of Bitcoin. You can do this yourself right now. You don't have to own Bitcoin to download a wallet and download the entire history of Bitcoin. Um, Download the Bitcoin Core wallet, the full version of the wallet that will download the entire history. You just need a few gigabytes I don't know if you know what it's up to right now, but you need to cut like 10 10 to 20 gigabytes of space to download the entire history of Bitcoin. And it built up in in the hobbyists and enthusiasts and people just excited about it. It called it magical internet money. Um, And I first heard about it then through anarchist means because I was into Stefan Molyneux and he talked about it back in 09 and, and... uh, 2010 as this new thing, and I, I thought it was cool back then, but I didn't think of it as an investment. Of course, you know, um, you kick yourself. But I was like, hey, cool, internet mo- uh, anarchy money. I hope that works out. And it's proved itself over the years to work out and to hold value and increase in value versus fiat currency exponentially. But it's not. It wasn't made as a get get rich quick scheme. So that's a huge problem with a lot of the new coins that come out is it's just a get-rich mentality. It's not designed to be a currency. It's not designed to be something that will hold value or be a decentralized network. Um, You also have centralized authorities in most of these other coins. Bitcoin was created by Satoshi Nakamoto, who we don't even know who that is or if it's one person or a group of people. They've stayed anonymous. They've never sold any of their initial coins. Um, you know, we, there's no one for people to attack. It's a decentralized network now. He's given the code out, and it's changed over time based on other people's wants that, that use it. So it's not controlled by a central person, and there's no central person for a government or entities to attack, to blackmail or control the network. It's just it's people's network. It's like the printing press for books. He's, he's, now money is in people's hands all over the world that will never lose value, that will always be 21 million, that will always be decentralized. So when you compare Bitcoin to something like, I mean, I, I could make a whole video about these, but, but Dogecoin, for instance, Dogecoin is actually just a copy and paste of the code of Bitcoin. But made to make infinite amount of Bitcoin and have faster uh, blocks into the ledger. So Litecoin as well, one of the first coins other than Bitcoin ever to exist was a copy of the code of Bitcoin. Um, I know Ethereum is, is trying to do interesting things. It's having a lot of issues. It also has a centralized authority. So again, look into the history of Bitcoin, look into the aspects of Bitcoin that make it unique, that make it special, that make it like gold, but digital, but better, um, and also transferable globally 24-7 on a network that's not controlled or owned by anyone. It's just the people using their computers, having nodes on their computers, and mining the next blocks. But anyone can download the node and help secure the network and decentralize the network. You can do it today by downloading it on your personal computer. So now I'm just going to get into actually just questions that I got from some of my friends on Facebook. 
So first, how do I get a wallet? So again, it's permissionless. A wallet is just going to be a program that someone has made on the internet that you download to your computer and it generates um, a random seed for you that is your access to the Bitcoin network. So there are many programs that do this. You can download them on your phone. There's Samurai Wallet uh, on your phone. There's uh, on the computer our Electrum, which I think is also on your phone. There are many wallets. Like I said, the Bitcoin Core Wallet, which is the official wallet that will download all of the history of the blockchain. Most wallets are what's called like a trimmed wallet, a basic wallet that's not going to have the whole history of Bitcoin on the wallet, so it's not really helping secure the network. So you might want to get the core, core version on your home computer and a lighter version on your phone. Um, but what happens when you download a wallet is you'll generate a new seed phrase is what it's called. And every cryptocurrency will have its own wallet or its own version of the cryptography that helps generate the wallets and the way it works. So you're going to want to download a Bitcoin wallet, specifically Bitcoin, not Bitcoin Cash, not Litecoin, not NEO. You want a Bitcoin wallet, and that's going to help you access the Bitcoin network. And you'll generate your random seed, which will create your private wallet. You'll get something like this. Um, this is like an official thing from a hardware wallet I got. You just get a piece of paper, and you write down the the seed phrase that it tells you. Because the seed phrase, it's your cryptographic key that will unlock your coins that get sent to this address and allow you to spend them. And they keep those private. These will never be entered into your computer. And in fact, the safest way to do it is to get a hardware wallet where the, the cryptographic keys are generated on your separate key and not on your computer. Because if you're using a cell phone or a personal computer to generate the key, if that computer is compromised, someone could screenshot your seed phrase when it generates, and it's not safe. They could steal those seeds. So you want to be careful. The seed phrase themselves is your way is your wallet. This is how you generate your wallet. Because the program you download that will randomly generate these words for you, the program and the files you have saved on your computer are not your wallet. You could delete those, you could destroy that computer. As long as you have these seed phrases, you could take them to another computer and a different wallet, not even the same program, it could be a different version. You could, you could have made it on Samurai and then go over to uh, Electrum and plug these words in and it's the same wallet, it's the same coins that you have stored there because it's a cryptographic key to access the Bitcoin code and the Bitcoin network, which again is open source. So anyone can make programs that access the network. But that's how you get a wallet is you download a program that creates the wallet for you and you store your seed phrase. Um, I would recommend if you're storing a great amount of Bitcoin to get a hardware wallet. I don't have one on me here, um, but it looks like a USB key, but it's not. It's, it's a mini computer basically that will generate Bitcoin codes and sign transactions for you connecting to your computer. So your, your seed phrase, your wallet phrase never has to actually get typed in or, or be on your computer so people can't steal it. Someone else asked, can Bitcoin be upgraded? I kind of mentioned this before, it can. It just has to come to a consensus with the network on how to upgrade it. Um, and in fact, this, this goes back to how Bitcoin is different from other coins. Bitcoin has proven itself over time. The network has proven resilient to people trying to change the network for the negative. So back in 2017, um, there was a huge, huge uh, kerfuffle, <laughs> uh, drama around people wanting to increase the block size. So every block of the ledger the Bitcoin blockchain is, uh, I want to say five megabytes. <laughs> I might be completely wrong. It's so many megabytes and people wanted to increase it. Um, and the problem with that is when you get bigger block sizes, you can fit more transactions in there, like per, per minute or per 10 minutes, which is really when every block comes out. Um, but 
it creates a bigger file. So we were talking about P2P file sharing earlier. This would mean that that file would get huge, potentially ginormous. It would make your fees smaller, but the files would get so large that normal people couldn't download the whole blockchain. It would get exponentially more costly to actually run a whole node, which the node and downloading the whole history of blockchain, that's how it secures itself. And that's how the network, it can be verified by anybody and not just an elite few. So if you make the block size too large and, and uh, so many files are getting, so many exchanges are getting put in there, the average person can't store that on their normal home computer. And only the huge supercomputers of the mining companies would be able to do it. So mining itself helps secure the network, but it's backed up by people that hold nodes. So anyone that runs a node is going to help secure the network even more so than uh, the miners. But the huge mining companies want, were actually kind of pushing for this, and that's what became Bitcoin Cash, because Bitcoin Cash has a larger block size. But people held fast, and what happened was the network actually split into what, what's called a fork. Is it split into Bitcoin Cash and, to, and stayed the original Bitcoin core? So Bitcoin Cash actually shares the entire history of Bitcoin back to that fork. And when they split, those coins became a separate network that people could then buy into or not. And at the time, if you held a Bitcoin wallet with coins in it, it would be split into a Bitcoin Cash as well. So you would get equal amounts of Bitcoin Cash for the Bitcoin you held. And most people, me myself included, just sold our Bitcoin Cash as soon as they were generated because we didn't want it and we wanted more Bitcoin. And that's the network that won, is the, the coin now that has the most users and the highest price, is the original Bitcoin before it was split off into Bitcoin Cash. Um, but yes, you, you, it can be upgraded in other ways. Uh, around that same time, they added SegWit. A SegWit was an update which allowed Bitcoin to shrink the block size a little bit so it could fit more transactions into a block, but not an extreme amount. Um, by using the same amount of space. Um, and it also allowed easier access to the um, Lightning Network, which is a Layer 2 solution. So people can make programs, again, that can access and talk to the Bitcoin code and the Bitcoin network that are a different program and operate differently. And Lightning Network allows people to lock away Bitcoin on the official network and then send them on a faster speed network called the Lightning Network. So with Lightning, you can actually send Bitcoin for a much cheaper cost, basically free, instantaneously, and it's faster than the actual Bitcoin network. Now, it loses some security, and, and it's not completely perfect, um, but it's, it's really just like trusting a bank at that point as well. So you, you'll have layers on top of Bitcoin, like PayPal even now, our cash app are creating their own network on top of the Bitcoin blockchain. So even though Bitcoin might not be able to do as many transactions as like Visa on the core uh, chain, you can attach things on top of it and add layers on top of it that interact with it. So it, it's like upgradable gold. So, you know, it, it's, it's Bitcoin is slower. It's uh, more secure, though, because of that. And it retains its shape better than a lot of the newer things that are coming out or than fiat, which can be changed at a whim by any government. So someone else asks, why is Bitcoin shitting the bed? Um, I, I got to be honest, it's, it's really relative. So when I first got into Bitcoin, well, really when I first got into Bitcoin, it was in 2014. So I'd heard about Bitcoin. And then I saw that it had gone up to like $200, $300, and I started to take it more serious. Like, wow, that's interesting. I should figure this out. So I learned that you could mine it, and I downloaded the mining software, and I started mining it, and I learned how to get my coins or my Satoshi, um, which is the fractions of a Bitcoin. So you know, I started to collect Satoshi and mine it. And I got on uh, Circle.com at the time, was one of the few places you could actually buy Bitcoin. 
and I bought a little bit of Bitcoin. At this time, Bitcoin was like two or three hundred dollars. So it went up to like four hundred dollars, and I thought that was crazy. And I had a whole Bitcoin back then, and I ended up selling it because I was really broke, and I wanted four hundred dollars. So fast forward twenty sixteen, and um, I see Bitcoin has gone up to a thousand dollars. So I'm freaking out and realize I need to take this more seriously. So I start buying it. I start buying it over time and Bitcoin goes up to like $2,000. And I'm like, wow, this is crazy. I can't believe it's at $2,000. So fast forward a month and it's at like $3,000 and it starts crashing. And I'm like, oh God, I'm losing all my value. Bitcoin goes, it dips below 2000 And I'm like, oh God, I'm starting to lose you know, what, what am I doing here? I can't believe Bitcoin's crashing. So I sell it and um, immediately Bitcoin starts going back up to $2,000. So that, that's when I, I got a quick lesson and realized, you know, like, okay, look, this thing's going to fluctuate. It's going to do crazy things. I need to just hold it. So I bought back in at 2000 and just held and kept buying a little bit over time, a little bit over time. Um, until eventually it went up to 20000 in 2017, peaked, and then crashed all the way back down to close around that panic moment. It went down to like $3,000 again. Um, and that's when you kind of learn, you learn that Bitcoin kind of goes in cycles. It has rises, it has falls, but the overall year-to-year -year growth is around 200% or more. So you, you realize it's this new thing it's gaining adoption at a really fast rate all over the planet. When when people hold a lot of this thing and it goes up in value an insane amount, it's hard to it's hard to fathom the amount that it's gone up in the time it's existed. People are gonna sell because they've just made a lot of fiat money, which is what we use to buy and, and sell things right now. So people are gonna sell it, it's gonna crash, and it's gonna go back up. So right now there's a bunch of Chinese FUD or fear, uncertainty, and doubt going. Uh, China has banned Bitcoin many times in the past, and it all, they always try and affect the price. Elon uh, Musk is, is dissing Bitcoin. Even though he didn't sell his Bitcoin, he's holding his Bitcoin because he knows it's the most valuable asset that exists right now on the planet. So people, co corporations, governments, rich individuals, they will say shit about Bitcoin to try and crash the price so then they can buy it at a lower price. But Bitcoin follows a four-year cycle, something that's called the halvening. So I was talking about its inflation rate. It halves every four years. After that happens, the supply gets cut short and miners start holding onto their coins and don't sell the new supply of Bitcoin, which causes the price to start skyrocketing. So every four years or so, Bitcoin will skyrocket to a new price. It will crash back down to around where the previous all-time high was. And it will continue back on its way, going back up to new all-time highs. So you have to think long-term with Bitcoin. It's a new commodity. It's the hardest money that's ever existed. Um, like I said, there will only be 21 million Bitcoin ever. And right now there are around 100 million people on the planet that use Bitcoin. So not only is that a fraction of the people on the planet, but even just that 100 million, they could never all own one whole Bitcoin. Like owning one whole Bitcoin will be a, a huge achievement in the future. It will make you enormously rich. So you just, you have to put it in perspective and realize that this is a new commodity that's slowly gaining recognition and it's going to increasingly gain recognition as it's doing this year with banks all over the world accepting it and learning how to onboard people and buying it themselves. So you just, you just have to ride the wave. Um, I call it dollar cost. Well, no, it's called dollar cost averaging where you, whatever is a small amount that you won't miss, $50 a paycheck, $20 a paycheck. That's how I started out. And consistently buy that Bitcoin every week or every month or every paycheck and store it away, save it. It's a long-term savings. In America, we don't think about savings anymore, but we need to. And Bitcoin is the best savings account you could ever put your, your value and your money into. 
This is not financial advice, but seriously. So like I was saying, 100 million people guesstimate. They don't really, people, we don't really know exactly, but about 100 million people on the planet out of 7 billion have Bitcoin. And there's something called the stock to flow model. Um, Google it. I'll put a picture of it here. Um, you can see like this little crash that Bitcoin is doing right here, how it barely is a blip on the stock to flow. And it looks just like it did back in 2017 when it was halfway up to the high it was going to hit that year. But stock to flow is just the new supply of Bitcoin versus the amount of people that want Bitcoin. So the amount of people that want Bitcoin is just exponentially going up since its creation. And the amount of new Bitcoin that are coming out is going down. Half every four years, the amount of new Bitcoin are coming out. So it's causing supply shock, which is an intentional design in Bitcoin. So again, the, the way it's designed is very elegant. It makes, it, it's like perfect game theory where people have to spend money, energy, to mine the Bitcoin, to create new Bitcoin, and then that amount gets halved every four years. So the incentive for miners is to hold on to the supply to cause supply shock to cause people to want to buy more at a higher price. So as miners get paid less Bitcoin, Bitcoin is becoming worth more. So the value of the Bitcoin that they're making, even though the amount of Bitcoin that miners are making is going down, the value is going up. So it creates this balance in the ecosystem that causes the price to skyrocket to exponential levels every four years. So this is going to happen, you know, until the last Bitcoin is mined, like a hundred years in the future. So you have to realize it's a long-term thing. Um, you know, what would gold be worth if people could know exactly how many gold there were on the planet and they knew there would never be more gold mined? You know, you have to start thinking about when there's a when Bitcoin is the standard of of currency and things are compared to that. How much is Bitcoin going to be worth? You know, when everyone on the planet owns a little bit of Bitcoin. So no, I don't think it has, and I I think Bitcoin is still on track to hit over a hundred thousand this year. Um, I'm thinking two to three hundred thousand, but again, no one knows. And even if Bitcoin did crash more, it wouldn't be the end of Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin's here to stay. Banks are starting to use it. Companies are starting to realize it's a store of value. And as long as fiat continues to do what it does and inflate to an insane amount, people are going to need something like Bitcoin to store their money long term. All right, one last question. Um, where is Bitcoin mining going? So as I was saying, in the future, you know, there won't be um, any new coins to mine. And what about the difficulty increasing? So the difficulty is increasing right now. So there's, there's something built into Bitcoin, which is um, mining. So mining is, it's basically a, a computer game that a bunch of supercomputers are playing to try and guess an insanely long number. So Bitcoin uses cryptography in multiple ways, but one of the ways it uses it is hashing. And a hash is just a giant number that it takes roughly 10 minutes for millions and millions of computers and processors and video cards and uh well then now now they use asic miners which is a specifically designed computer that just hashes the giant bitcoin number so it's like a lottery where you're trying to guess a giant code and they're all guessing millions of computers are guessing numbers for about 10 minutes and it takes about 10 minutes for them to guess the right number when they guess that number they then are the ones that get to publish the new bitcoin block into the blockchain they they are using their node their local node they're able to assign the transactions waiting in the mean pool publish that transaction to the blockchain and then all the other miners get signaled using the P2P network that, hey, ooh, the new block's been mined. And as the, those miners find out, they start mining the next block. And those nodes then accept that block as the transaction. And the next block starts to get mined or the next number is trying to get guessed. So right now, those miners are paid in Bitcoin. 
which um, again is being halved every four years. So eventually they'll be being paid less and less and less Bitcoin until eventually there are no more Bitcoin. But the, the difficulty level comes, so the difficulty increase, so there's two separate things. So the payout of Bitcoin and the difficulty are two completely separate things. So the difficulty is designed so that the 10 minute function stays the way it is. So Bitcoin is designed so that every 10 minutes is when the next Bitcoin block is published. And the way that that 10 minutes is kept is the difficulty of the hash or the number that the miners are trying to guess. So to keep it at 10 minutes, so say, say you have 10 people mining. It would take those 10 people, I don't know, we'll, we'll just say it's programmed this way, so that 10 people mining can guess it in about 10 minutes. So what if you get 100 people then start mining? So they're going to guess it 10 times faster. So they're going to guess it in about a minute. So in order to prevent that from happening, when the Bitcoin network detects that more people are mining and they're guessing the number faster than 10 minutes, it increases the difficulty of the number that they're trying to guess. So it makes the number longer, which means that it's going to take longer for all these computers guessing numbers to guess that number. So all the difficulty is, is a balancing act to, so that if more people are mining, the number becomes longer so that it's harder to guess. If less people are mining, the number becomes shorter and it's easier to guess. So difficulty is constantly fluctuating and will do so until the end of time. But as Bitcoin becomes more popular, odds are more people are going to be mining because they want to get Bitcoin. So the difficulty will increase steadily as adoption increases. And that will help it balance out as more people adopt it, the price also goes up. So the amount that miners are making is going to balance out for how many new people are mining. So again, everything is a balancing act. So this also relates to the, um, the difficulty and the coins getting halved. So eventually when there's no more Bitcoin to mine, miners will just be paid in fees, which miners are already paid in fees now, partly. But that's part of the curve. So as less and less Bitcoin are mined, miners will be paid more and more in fees. And it's not that the people using Bitcoin will have to pay exponentially higher fees, but that will help increase what Bitcoin is worth. Because, again, that's, that's part of the function of helps the stock-to-flow model and why Bitcoin increases in value the way it does is because miners holding those coins help control the market. So as they sell those coins, they're deciding what price is worth it for them to sell based on the electricity they're having to spend and their processors and what they have to buy to mine Bitcoin. So as less and less Bitcoin are given to them, they will be incentivized to hold it longer and longer, increasing the value of Bitcoin because there's be less and less in the marketplace. So by the time that miners are paid only in fees, the value of Bitcoin will be so great that it will still be about the equivalent of what they're mining now or better. Um, so again, the, the mining issue is not really an issue with Bitcoin, um, but people are confused about the Ethereum process, and you know I am too. I know Ethereum is switching to staking, which is separate from the proof of work or the mining. It won't be mined anymore. Um, and no one knows exactly what's going to happen with that or when that's going to happen. So I can't give a clear answer on that question because Ethereum is centrally controlled. It's controlled by uh, Vitalik. I don't remember his name. But the main guy that runs Ethereum, it's a company. You know, it's, it's, it's a team. It's one guy. They can really do whatever they want, even though that they pretend that there's a consensus. But, you know, Bitcoin is completely separate in that sense that it's already set in stone you know the, the and the the network has decided how they want it to be but with ethereum we really we're at his whim we don't really know what they're going to do with ethereum or how that's going to change to proof of stake um, and how smooth that's going to be you know I, I actually mine ethereum now but i get paid in bitcoin because i don't trust the ethereum network really and i don't know what's going to happen with uh, ethereum mining I suspect in a year or two we won't be able to mine anymore, but I don't know. They keep pushing things back. So that's going to have to do it. 
um, for this uh, episode. I have a lot to say about Bitcoin. I feel like I can put my thoughts even better than I did in this video. Um, if you have any questions about Bitcoin, please send them my way and I'll try and answer them. Um, I'm, you know, I've been studying Bitcoin for close to a decade and I still feel like a novice. So, you know, there's a lot to learn and there's a lot to know. So, um, don't feel dumb if you're new to the space. Just realize Bitcoin is not crypt is not all of crypto. It's a separate thing. Every crypto is not equal, and Bitcoin is a, stands apart from everything else, in my opinion. So, uh, accept no substitutes. Buy Bitcoin, hold, and uh, you'll be all right. But uh, this is gonna do it for today's episode of the Logical Shaman. And everybody have a great rest of your day, week, and I'll catch you next time.